Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'm your host. Over the years, I've read too many obituaries and left wondering that I wish I got to meet that person while they were alive. Well, this show is all about interviewing some wonderful Vermonters and a few people outside of Vermont who have wonderful lives, and they're still alive. And so my belief is that everyone, no matter how famous or not a person is, has a story to tell. If you'd be interested in being interviewed on this show, please write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for the person I'm interviewing, uh, please do the same. Write me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com, and I'll make sure that we get that question over to the person interviewed. Today, I'd like to introduce Emily Anderson. I'm happily, happy and honored to have you as a guest, Emily. Mm, thank you, Gary. So we're going to celebrate your life today. Great. Where would you like to begin? Hmm. Well, um, I guess right now, and, and part of that is because even just coming into this space, um, I do a lot of things in this space with the program that I coordinate called mm -hmm. the Bridging Program. Yeah. So, so I want to kind of say that because at the same time, I, I love the idea of this conversation where we can kind of weave together two roles that I seem to have created with my life um, so far, and that is, is supporting and advocating and um, developing the, the space for young people with disabilities mm -hmm. to, to be themselves and love themselves and know who they are so that they can and learn about the world and they come here and we make a TV show okay. about whatever um, we usually have kind of an idea but mm -hmm. we, we give them really the tools and the space to to learn that that's what CCTV and other stations like this are for media making places Absolutely. are for Yes. to tell your story, not the Hollywood story or the... <laughs> right. Um, and and that, that's that been a, a through line in my life of, for a while, working with people with disabilities and supporting them and telling their story. Um, and then there's also this other part of my life, which uh, is this drawing technique that I developed and use on a daily basis mm. to support and help me feel okay being me and having hope and positive thoughts and um, being able to um, live live you know happily and and feeling some sense of success with the different you know projects or obstacles I'm facing yeah and and that's been fun to share with others so how did this amazing woman be the person that she is today what what were some of the early parts of your life that pieced together over the years to become who you are today? Well, I think um, uh, I, re I really benefited from, I grew up in Rochester, New York. I had two parents, two brothers, younger than me. Um, my parents chose um, to stay and rear have their children grow up in Rochester, and mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of people in the 60s moving out, there are a lot of white people moving out of the city to live in the suburbs, and my parents really wanted to be part of their city that they had grown up in. Mm. My grandparents also lived in that city, and that, um, that I feel like having my grandparents around, and I've even read that people who have that sort of regularly knowing that it's not just their own home that they're getting mm -hmm. love from, but outside of the home. Right. And, and our, um, so I know that really set a foundation for me. Um, and my, uh, my, I also believed in fairness. And so I had a grandmother and my, uh, on the one side I had a grandmother because my grandfather had died. Um, so I had a dead grandfather on that side. Yeah. And then I had um, my mother's parents were both deaf. So I had two mm. deaf grandparents. Mm. And I realized that I should, 
I could, I, I seem to have like had often had this like good intuition where I had a feeling, you know, this could go a funny way where I can only talk to my grandmother. Mm -hmm. I'm going to really make an effort to be able to communicate well with everybody. So that included my dead grandfather. I made sure every Sunday I would, there had this place I would talk to him, mm -hmm. you know, and just sort of think about what he would be saying back to mm -hmm. me. And then my grandmother, uh, my deaf grandmother for years had been giving me a man, they, they didn't use sign language, they used finger smelling. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in Rochester, the Rochester School for the Deaf, that was their form of communication that yeah. they wanted to encourage the students so that they, they developed like a full sense of like an English sentence right. versus with signs. Uh, with American Sign Language, your your sense of English, you know, it's a different, it's yes, a different, different language. Different language, totally. Um, with the different and syntax, so so she kept giving me the manual alphabet card, saying, "Okay, you know, come on, yeah. learn, learn your finger spelling." And I'd be like, "No," and then finally, I think I had that thought, like, you know, I'm be fair, and, wow. and so I I learned it, and I really loved that. I, I became that really brought me very close to my grandparents. Mm. I was close to all of them, obviously. Mm. Um, How old were you at that point? That was probably probably eight, between eight and ten years old. Mm. And and I, I my grandfather, uh, I would do a lot of things with my my grandparents because he he have, he loved cars. He had worked in the car industry his whole life, but he realized he couldn't drive anymore. So he had me be the driver of their car, and I would drive them to their um, their their dad. They had a they were part of a club called Deer, which is deaf elderly around Rochester. Because my my grandfather was a huge. They were, <laughs> both of them were m pillars of the deaf community. Wow. Also, where mm. my grandfather served in every um, role in the New York State Association for the Deaf that wow. he could. He went to. They went to conventions throughout the country. They wrote a newsletter in their wow. attic. Um, so they were. So Deer was really very sweet. You know, it was mm. all their old friends from the deaf school. And the deaf are fascinating because they would graduate from the deaf school, but they wouldn't, there wasn't like a deaf neighborhood. So they lived right. all different places and, and did a great job depending, you know, finding neighbors who could help with things because this is pre, That's you amazing. know, TTY. Yeah. Um, and, and they would come together as a community, though, at times. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was yeah. very joyous and yeah. fun. I mean, I it's bet. just such an incredible. The, the hands were moving. Yeah. And the, yeah. Yeah. Oh, exciting. So, um, so I think that, and definitely that has linked me to mm. my work with people with disabilities. Absolutely. And, um, and then I went, when I was, you know, I think I had this pivotal moment, and it's, it's, it's sort of had, I had a, you know, a great real remembering of it. When I was 12 years old, my mother took us to see the movie Hair. Yep. And it completely changed my life because I think growing up mm. with the feeling of the Vietnam War all around, you know, we watched, the, I remember we used to watch the TV during dinner mm -hmm. <laughs> until it fell over and broke mm -hmm. and we didn't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. But I think seeing that movie just made me realize the power of theater and the power of delivering a story that had hope in it and like, you know, something can change. Because I had definitely, yeah. growing up in Rochester, I went to alternative public high schools. I was sort of surrounded by the efforts of the people in my life or the predecessors of the adults in my life mm. to try to make a difference. Yes. How can we, yes. how can we, integrate the schools you know we went I went to a school called world of inquiry where they just found kids from all over the city you know all nationalities and put them together just wow. really working on you know the the difficult race relations that yeah. that happened when were happening when I was born wow. so I saw that movie and it just it was like theater I'm going to do theater, and that sort of helped me mm. start to have a trajectory of I'm a theater person, and I found a great summer theater camp that I could be a part of that 
that was all, you know, all of a sudden I had like a community of other kind of, you know, like-minded like people. Like people, and we did plays. We did the first play we did was Runaways by Elizabeth Suedos, mm. which is a great ensemble piece where where she had gone out and talked to to young people who had run away, and then collected their story together and made it into wow. a musical. Oh. And we just all everyone in the camp that year really bonded over that. I bet. And then. We went the next year. We did the Studs Circles Working, oh, which yes. was again wow. another. My goodness. Yeah. So that, and then just having seen this this film, just you know, it was so I'm gonna be an actor. I'm gonna do some, you know, mm -hmm. something. And I I I then changed schools and I went to alternative high school. I had taken a co a few years where I went to a traditional high school, but then I went to school without walls. It was a small school that was started by former teachers of the high school I was in and who just were like, how can we do high school different? This is right. not working. And they had they told a story when I went to the one of the anniversaries for the school where where there was a sign up, you know, teachers, do you want to make a difference? How can we make this better? And they gathered everyone together in a room and and somebody, like the majority of the people were like, okay, we need to have police officers in the school. We need to have more bells and more like restrictions. And a bunch of people just put their heads down and, and the people left. Yep. And the people who looked around were like, what is going on? They're the people who started the high school. They're wow. like, we have to do something different. Wow. So School Without Walls was born. Wow. And I went there and... Um, and in that school, you you wrote a, you kept a journal, and mm -hmm. you you had an extended class teacher, and that was kind of your home base class. So I had an art class um, that was led by Bob Giroux, and so he was a person who was reading my journal, and he finally was like, Emily, you keep talking about hair, because I also <laughs> love the actor who. The Treat Williams, who recently, who died on June twelfth, he actually ended up living right, here, right here in Manchester. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yes. Did you get to meet him at all ever? No. Um, no. Okay. No, but yeah. it was just cool. I didn't. I knew he was in. I knew he had connections to Vermont, but yeah. I didn't realize what. I mean, I know the community is certainly mourning yeah. the loss of Absolutely. him. Absolutely. So, so I just adored him, like. You know, Melissa Gilbert, I learned on Instagram, also adored him <laughs> because he, he took that role and did it, you know, so well. And, and so, so Treat Williams also meant many things to me. Like, mm. I, you know, there were some struggles I had in my uh, media at home. And, and, you know, he was my long lost brother and he was mm. going to save me from this. And I mm. wrote all the time all these different, you know, wonderful things that, mm. you know, 15 year olds, right? Right, exactly. But my teacher, Bob Drew, was like, you keep talking about hair, the movie Hair. You need to see the Bread and Puppet Theater. And they're coming to town oh. in Rochester. They're going to, you know, at 10 o'clock or 3 o'clock, you know. And at my school, you know, there was something that was connected to art, which was your extended you class, just go. Yeah. And so, so I went, and it was May 25th, and it was. All, all the puppeteers that I have since met there remember that day because it snowed. May 25th? May 25th in Rochester, <laughs> New York. It snowed. They also got in trouble with the police because they were riding around on their bus playing, um, like playing band music from the roof of it. Right. So, so it was a memorable show, but I saw that and I was just like, okay. And then they were also, mm. they also did an inside show because they were on a whole tour with, a whole group of people, a whole group of of performers, and it was anti-nuclear thing. It was called the Panned yeah. Tour, but I can't remember what P A N. Some performers against nuclear. Well, or I guess it wouldn't be against nuclear disarmament, but yeah. Yeah, some I, I, yeah. <laughs> They're performers gotcha. addressing <laughs> nuclear okay. disarmament. Yeah, yeah. Um, and and I was just like, oh. Okay, and then it just happened that when I went to college, um, 
the theater department was closed because they were trying to get rid of one final tenured professor. I went to a very small school, Antioch College. Oh, in New small Hampshire. but very fam famous. Yes, the yes. one in um, Ohio. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. The home. The home base. Yes. Yep. Yellow Springs. Let me carefully. Yellow Springs, Ohio. Let me flip this on the other side. Okay. And, um, so, but I, I, so Yellow Spring, that school is a mm. co op school. So you spend, you know, six months of the year away at a job that's connected with your field. Yes. So, um, so I went, I did a whole bunch of things connected with environmental studies. But one time I came back and a couple from the San Francisco Mime Troupe had mm. joined, had, were there to start a theater department. Wow. And, um, and that was wow. very exciting. And it was the first time like political theater had really mm. arrived in my life. Because all through my two years in high school, my final years, um, you got to do a senior project. And I had finished all my classes. So... So the senior project that I was able to do was to just go work at a theater. So mm -hmm. I worked every day almost at a repertory theater. So there were six shows and actors coming in from all of the equity actors. Yep. And then I did, like, I built a stage, you know, for the first one. I did scenic design for the second one. I did props for the third. Wow. And, I, and it was great wow. because I also had this, like, really strong work ethic, like, I think also, you know, as a result of things being a little unsettling at home, I was just like, if I'm working, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, your so I worked. Yeah. So I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to like, I, I feel like I work a little bit too much now, like, I, or, I'm trying to take that, like, take that back a little. <laughs> yes. And um, work to live, not live to work. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So. Emily, uh, I mentioned a couple of times that things at home were a little tough, it sounds yeah. like. At, at the same time, I get the sense that mom and dad were special people to help set that foundation for you mm -hmm. to be the creative yeah. person that you are. Can you yeah. talk a little um, bit about them? I would say my mom, my mom, her, and I actually live with my mom now. Okay. My husband and I. Um, moved in with my mother who lives in a beautiful place near the lake and starting to think oh I want to stay here but it'd be wonderful to have more um, support here mm. and it's just a perfect situation for us so oh, my mom's very present in my life on a day-to-day -day basis but in thinking about what she gave me she um, was early she you know her parents ate Kind of like they lived, they were at the deaf school because <laughs> mm -hmm. they, they ate a lot of canned things. They were not inventive cooks. Um, and my mom had this whole interest in eating wholesome and eating, but you know, she was early on with the bulk food movement yep, yep. and just had these food gurus and we would look at her, their cookbooks if we were going to make something. So just... A real, a real awareness of what you put in your body is is really important mm -hmm. to know what it is, yeah. to be knowledgeable. Yeah. Um, she also did yoga. She was one of those early adopters doing yoga. Oh. She also found the church that we were a part of, and I even graduated from because because I went to school without walls and it didn't have a place for to graduate but we were involved in the Unitarian Church okay yep and that was where I went to preschool um, that's where my mom did yoga classes oh, that's we were we had really great Sunday school classes and that's where actually I very first started doing theater was because we had a it was called Biblical Jesus class and we would put on Jesus Christ Superstar and Godspell and the first time I took the class, uh, they they um, wrote a play that was, mm. yeah, made a play, mm. made a musical about Jesus's life. Mm. And so my my whole, you know, understanding of of Jesus is is through song or celebration mm. of him. And that that was that great. Was so she 
And did you say she helped found that particular? Oh, she found it. In, she, yeah. in Rochester? Oh, she wasn't a founder, right. but she, yeah. Oh, she, she found, I see what you're saying. She was looking around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, where yeah. my parents got married. But my grandparents, they were Episcopalian. And my grandmother, I'm not sure what she was because there's a great story about her husband being at the church down the street and and the pastor said negative things about JFK being Catholic and my grandfather just got up Took and off. said we will not be at this church anymore. <laughs> this does not matter what, what religion he is. Right. So, um, But anyways, uh, she, she was a great outside-of-the-box thinker yes, and for where she, where she, you know, her upbringing. And mm. then, you know, it's, you know, I'm still discovering, you know, the challenges that she had being, she's technically called a CODA, a child of deaf adults. Mm -hmm. and, mm. and that's a whole experience to be Absolutely. kind of an outsider in your home. She had a wonderful older sister who was kind of like a parent to her and had taken the brunt of, you know, going to the doctor with your parents at a very mm. young age and talking about complicated things mm. and, and taking the difficult, you know, phone call or, mm. you know, receipt. So translating a lot of times with yeah. other professionals and yes, and yeah. situations. Okay. But, but I think because fingerspelling is really hard, it's, it's easy to do, but it's hard to um, receive it. So, so she was a little out of the, you know, in the dark with, you know, her parents would be talking and it, it wasn't like she could easily know what they were talking about, right. which with sign language, I think would be with American sign language, it would just be, you're going to, you're going to learn it because it's in the house and you'll see it and be able to pick up those, pick it up. Yeah. So I, I, I can, think. Can you give us a quick little, like say, hi, Gary, with that? Oh, finger spelling? Yeah. Which is fun because, like, even just like your name has a nice flow to it. So, as someone who did a lot of finger spelling, mm -hmm. there's a joy in, in there's some words that are just like mm. fun. And, um, but, but to finger spell everything right. is, is a lot. I mean, and it, it's not hard to do, it, but it's hard to receive. Yes. If you're not, I mean, my grandparents, you know, they could talk in their sleep to each other right. they, they they knew it on a whole wow. fundamental different wow. level yes um so i think there is a, a bit of a outsider feeling which i feel like i also grew up with somehow mm -hmm. this kind of i don't fit in um and i you know i've always tried to pinpoint that and i i think it, it does come probably from you know my sure. mother having that yes as a strong yes. feeling now my father, my father is very. I feel like I feel like my inward parts of me are from my mom and her family, and my outward orientation to the world is much like my father's. He was very gregarious and friendly, and loved to talk to people. and And I realize when I'm with other other people from the Andersons, you know, that's what we do. We mm -hmm. are we are going to be the person who talks to the person on the street and find yep. out he just moved here and he's from UVM and he but he came from Wyoming yesterday and <laughs> and, and that and um, so I got that from him. But my father also really struggled as you know he grew up in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, mm -hmm. and he was you know he realized later in life um, you know. I think he did some soul searching after he was dealing with cancer mm. that he was a gay man mm. and and you know and that that played itself out in my family you know in a coming to a realization and at a certain point my mom and father split for a year which was fascinating because it was so cool mm. to go to my dad's apartment and see what he chose to put in it yes because I growing up right. with a grandmother who was a widower and my grandparents, there's a wonderfulness to being with just one person and mm. seeing how they hold Shape their, their life. Yes, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So with my father, after he, you know, so he came out and, you know, my, uh, my they actually, my parents moved back, uh, my father moved back to my mother's because they, 
they just were such a team. Mm. They're very different people. Mm -hmm. um, and but they were they were a team. Mm. And but my father did have two boyfriends. He when he died, he had a wife and two boyfriends. Mm. <laughs> and we had a big celebration of his life. Oh. And then I felt like after that, all my artwork was somehow processing my father's story. But then when I got to the fairies, I realized this is the true legacy of my father. Mm. And that is, is I, um, my father one time gave me a book at Christmas by the uh, artist Sark. And she does all these books um, for you to express yourself and figure out who you are and be happy. And this was called Living the Succulent Life. And my dad wrote on it inside. He's like, I think you need this book. And I think, you know, I, I was thinking, yeah, I, I, I well, my, my theater work did bring me to the Bread and Puppet Theater. So that, so I had a long, 10 years that I lived in Glover and worked full time with the theater really? and traveled all over the world wow and um and then he gave me the book when i had moved here when i was ready to start my life um and and realized oh working with people with disabilities it like i'd worked with so many mm -hmm. different cultures and so many different groups and originally when i moved here i wanted to work with seniors and help them tell their stories and i did lots of work with the seniors that we told lots of stories, but they did not want to go on the road. But at the same time, um, a friend had connected me with working with people with disabilities, and I taught a puppetry class, and that all um, evolved into creating a theater company, and that sort of all, all was happening. And, and I think that work is so important, and I've even sort of evolved a bit in that work in that I am more aligned with the self-advocacy movement, and it's less about I want to direct someone to tell their story than create the space yep. and see what someone wants to do or how they want to do it, or better yet, they lead it, and I, I find a way to support huh. that. But that takes a lot of work, and I think uh, my father in giving me the book was like, how can I support this person supporting herself and mm -hmm. what keeps her going and what does she yeah. need and what good thoughts does she regularly yeah. need to, to keep and how can she keep her vibration a bit higher than yes. being That's, frustrated or depressed. And yeah. Sounds like a good father who was taking care of his daughter. <laughs> I think so. Yes, he was. Yeah, mm -hmm. so, so the fairies, you know, in a way are this tribute to him. First, they're fairies, but... Um, the fairies definitely started with drawing, as we were talking about before the yeah. show, what was difficult in my life as demons and using my non-dominant hand um, to name the demon, draw it. Sometimes I'm the demon. Sometimes I'm interacting with the demon. And then the most important part, which we didn't talk about, is writing the word antidote and then the as you're writing it, think, what is the first thing I can do to address this? Mm. Like, what is the first step? Is it, oh, go outside and smell something nice? Mm -hmm. or, or, and the antidotes are as curious as the names of the demons. Because as I write it, I'm always like, what? That's funny. Because I was telling Gary earlier that when you write with your non-dominant hand, you are connecting with something different in you, right. more truthful. And um, so give, an, give us an example of uh, a demon that you may have. Oh, got, oh you have, let me see. I, this is my last summer. I did kind of a, a, a de, fairy and demon journal. And I'll, I'll, well, let's see. Well, here's the first one. Demon of any negative thoughts that float into me and cloud my way. And let's see, and I'll send a. Uh huh. So. And the anecdote. The antidote is, oh, look for green to grow your inner light. Wow. Well, let's That's see if I can. Um, and this is all done with your non-dominant hand. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Uh, so. Amazing. 
demon of awful decisions that poorly affects, oh, this was right after the Roe versus Wade was <laughs> overturned, demon of awful decisions that poorly affect so many and dampen our morale. Antidote, pray and proceed with living fully. Mm. You want to show that to the, the audience there? That's amazing. And then, and then somehow after this, I probably drew like a hundred and then I, I started to have less to draw. And in my, in, I have, and it was, it was on a bigger paper. I've sort of evolved into using these four by six index cards, but even into those drawings, these fairies started coming and I never thought, okay, I'm going to be someone who draws fairies. <laughs> but um, the fairies are always something that has happened that day or something that just feels like it could be positive words. One of my favorite ones is the fairy of it's all going to happen. And then and she's a funny, she's such a funny looking fairy. That's what's also funny is as you draw them, you're like, this is so funny looking. And then it becomes like your favorite fairy. So the fairy of... Do you have any pictures of your fairy? Um, I, I might be able to... So the fairies, the fairies turned into cards. I had a friend who saw them all over my house and she's like... Because I, I, I used to put out the ones that were most resonant with me, including the demons, because I always felt like the demons actually are more resonant because mm -hmm. that antidote in there. Um, but my friend was like, let's, let's print the fairies. I don't want to deal with your demons. <laughs> I now want to start creating <laughs> cards with demons. But she, she is a great um, Let's graphic see. artist, so she figured yeah. out a great Fair way to do it. Food from the farm, love it, live it. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> all done with your non-dominant hand. Here's the fairy of it's all going to happen. Wow. Have fun. Ha yeah, and the important thing is to remember to have fun while it's all going to happen, because usually we're in the midst of. <laughs> and, and do these fairies? Do you ever like tell a whole story with a particular fairy? Yeah, because what happened was when we first rolled them out, which was nine years ago at Art Hop, um, I just had, I had, I had these tucked away someplace and I had little pictures of, like, for some reason I, I wanted to only show <laughs> like little Xeroxes of the pictures and if someone was interested, they could tell me the number and I would give them the fairy. <laughs> but then we started to do, I was like, well, you know, three days for this. I put all the numbers, there were 63, I put 63 numbers in the box and people got to pick their number and then that would be their fairy. Uh -huh. And I would, I would like tell a story about it or just kind of see, well I was just so interested to see how a, a whole bunch of people, all different kinds of people were responding to these little drawings that I had drawn with my left hand, like it was a big like share. Yeah. Um, but then... And I met the man that I married that on the third day of Art Hop. He came in and he was like, oh, wow, you have an Oracle deck. You should make a Fairy of the Day app. And I was just like, okay. And, uh, and then he started talking about uh, the generator makerspace. And I, I had been working on a huge project. Uh, my theater company ended with a final project, which was creating a movie uh, with a man named Mark Utter, and Mark Utter is a no, Mark. brilliant yeah. person, yeah. Yeah. and he types to communicate, and I had previously been trained to support communication of people with autism with this form of communication, right. which again fits into growing up with people who fingerspell right. because it's letter by letter, often very slowly, yep. but Mark had wanted to he said, you know, I just want to work on some ideas for a play, maybe that awareness can, awareness theater company can do about my life. And, you know, for a couple of years, I was like, this seems like a really huge project. And I, and then finally we sat down and then it did evolve into a project over five or six years. He wrote just ideas for scenarios that he put all together. And then we showed them to Rusty DeWeese, mm -hmm. who was, had done a lot of th different things with 
our theater company. He's my one contact with Treat Williams because he was in a play. He was in a movie with uh, Treat Williams. Oh. So that made him always like, oh, special. special. <laughs> and um, Interesting. So, so Rusty Dewey's read it and he's like, well, this is a bunch of scenarios. But what I think would be interesting is if you told a day in your life and show how in your life, because of your communication disability, you, you, there are things that you can't access. Yep. And how could that be different? And yep. so Mark's like, great, I'm throwing this out. And he, you know, and when any time he threw something out, that was like two years more. Because <laughs> we work. had some funders who were like, we're ready to produce the play. Oh, no, it's a, it's a movie. OK, we're ready to help you produce the movie. And, and they'd be like, OK, we'll get right back to you. But for us, it would be two years. But right. um, this. This is sort of the most, the, I mean, the biggest project I've done in my life is to support someone to, um, to go through this process, then raise the money. We mm -hmm. raised $60,000 to, wow. to do the film. And, and the film's called I Am In Here, A View of My Daily Life with um, suggest, Good Suggestions from My Intelligent Mind. And what Mark said is, this film outed me as an intelligent man. Wow. And, and it was a pretty amazing, very amazing experience just to be uh, in the process of that, um, in the presence of that, um, the energy that he had to do this work. And, and once, and just also, as soon as he put it out there, like, I'm doing this, people from all over came to, you know he yeah. we the sixty thousand dollars was from coin drops and and little events we would do where we would just meet people and then they'd want to support and so people wow. just came forth and wow. and i i know i would i would wake up when i was working on that project i would wake up right away at six o'clock i would have no idea why and i just would work all day it was sort of like this creative force was in me mm -hmm. that was just helping mm. to make this come wow. to life. Um, now, now, you skipped real quick over the fact that you met your husband at Art Hop on day three. Yeah. So yeah. That, that little interaction yeah. you had. So, so what happened was, was he was connected with the generator makerspace. And, and for a while, Christy Mitchell was there. And she had been talking with me and Mark and other people so I, along with Mark, I knew some other pretty amazing, very amazing people who use facilitated communication and are very articulate, intuitive, wonderful people. And, and I feel like are, you know, sometimes when you feel like, my, well, obviously, my grandparents have never really died. They're very, pr I think mm. about them every day. Mm. But when you realize, when you've been nurtured in your life by people with disabilities, yeah. You, I don't, there's, it's, I was hearing, that one of, I was reading something by another person who is a CODA, and he said, you know, there's, because my parents were deaf, there's a part of me that is deaf. Mm -hmm. And even though I don't, not hear, there's a, there's a, and so I, I feel like having been so nurtured and, and raised by people with, with, you know, a, they would never say they had a disability, but and and in many senses they didn't. They, right. they but they they did. But the, yeah, and, and in how to fit into our culture as right. we we do it. And you got to see them actualize people, though. I mean, they were yeah. out there. They were leaders. They were yeah. system change people. Yeah. So one of the things that happened in a conversation with Mark and other people who use facilitated communication, Tracy Thresher being, Tracy Thresher and Larry Bissonette are two men mm. who started in a movie called Wretches and Jabberers about, um, it's a wonderful movie. It's my favorite movie. Mm. <laughs> and I just, last year we watched it in the bridging program and the students all completely loved it. But it's two men who use facilitated communication traveling the world and meeting others who wow. do it or are interested in it. Wow. And Larry was the first person I worked with when I moved to Burlington and I was trained to work with, okay. trained in this yep. form of communication. So we were, I was in, and 
I then since became friends with Tracy because after I worked on Mark's film, I was like, well, I've supported Mark so much, I should have more experience working with other people. Mm -hmm. And so I was working at Washington County Mental Health where they have a really great communication program that's very specifically focused mm. on FC. And, but I was at a meeting with Tracy and Mark Oh, Mark, Mark and Tracy were starting to hang out more because they had become friends through the movie making proce process. And M Tracy had this comment. He said, you know, Mark, it sounds like you are always having to cheer Emily up. Like you're always like her positive, you know, she's not feeling, you know, yeah, you have this really, s and it was true. Mark was, you yeah. know, he was always like cheering me on and giving me good thoughts about things. Like this is going to be okay. I mean, we had gone through a huge yeah, project, right. and I was the front person. I remember yeah. we were going to do an appeal, and he was like, "Emily, you get out there and you put that smile on, <laughs> talk to those people," you know. And you know that <clears throat> that he had to, he, uh. I, he had to kind of keep pumping me up because he was what what was yeah. helping to propel this movie forward. Yep, yep. But Tracy looked at me and he said, do you have anything in your life that you can call upon to help you be more positive for yourself? Mm. <laughs> and, and I remember riding my bike. I was living out in Hinesburg in this uh, beautiful round house um, that, that was really bit in the sw in swamplands. It would flood regularly, uh. but there were ferns everywhere. I was doing lots of drawing and I was like, my drawings that is what that's what helps me this is what has to keep uh, look i picked up the ferry of independence there you go <laughs> it's open and okay <laughs> um yep. so that's when i really you know uh, and i guess this whole time we were talking we were, it's it's very intertwined how this this work is for me and after i met brian oh the reason i was excited was that uh, Christy Mitchell, who was the first uh, eg executive director of the Generator Makerspace, mm -hmm. she would often see me at Wadi oh, Muddy Waters with Mark typing, and she's like, I want to do a huge thing that support, you know, shows these guys at their best typing and having smart people asking them great questions mm -hmm. because this will just shift the paradigm. Yes. And so as soon as um, Brian said, oh, I'm connected with the generator makerspace, I was like, oh, well, we should talk more. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give you my business card. And, and I had just made a website to promote Bluebird Fairies, but I also included all the work I had done with people with disabilities and Mark's movie and mm -hmm. other movies I had created uh, with people. Uh, and um, and so he went and he read everything in the website and then sent me an email and said, oh, you have done such amazing work. I would love to collaborate with you. And I just thought, oh, somebody wants to collaborate with me. <laughs> but, but it also had this like special zing. Like I just felt like, oh, something very special is, mm. is happening. And I, I, mm. I remember going to see where my friend was exhibiting because I just needed to be seen, like, and yep. then I went, I, I went and saw my mother, and again, it was just like, something has happened. Uh -huh. And then what was great was Brian was working in the maple sugaring industry and and was helping to, oh, they were they were ta they were laying lines for this huge thing that was happening up in Island Pond. So he was he was away a lot. So I would so we had a correspondence for like it felt like forever, but I think it was like fifteen days. Uh -huh. um, yep. And that was such a beautiful correspondence. Mm. Just, you know, in the morning I would get a email from him and at some point I would write him an email mm. and it just went back and forth, mm. and there was one lost email, and there was this, oh, everything has ended, and then the fear of, have I made this, total, you know, is this person really who I think they mm -hmm. are? Uh, and, uh, yeah. A, a beautiful dance, it sounds yeah. like. Yes. Yeah, so we, we, uh. we, yeah, so we, you know, having got, gotten married later, so then we got married, we just celebrated our fourth anniversary, or no, our fifth anniversary last week. Wonderful. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, so we have a very intentional 
yep. wedding and a uh, uh, ceremony or marriage. Yep. And the fairies are part of it every day. We pick a fairy. Oh, I was going to have you pick your fairy. Yep. Fairy of the day. Fairy of the day. Well, this one looks good with a little heart there. Fairy of vitamin D. <laughs> Sun or a little pill, get some every day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, this is definitely... I love that. We need the little pill this summer. Especially with this summer. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah, and this, uh. this card, this came up at Art Hop. There was a, a girl, a little girl had, you know, done the number thing, and she picked this one, and I was just like, I said to the mom, oh, I think this is kind of an adult fairy. Like, uh -huh. maybe my fairies are adult focused. And she said, oh, no. She totally doesn't get the amount of vitamin D she needs because she doesn't drink milk. And so we actually have on our list that today we have to buy, buy vitamin no D. No kidding. So I was just like, wow. okay. Wow. I mean, it is often uncanny the, That's wonderful. what shows up. So wow. then Brian made me a fairy booth. And so for many years, first it was at a holiday event. But then for several years at the Arts Riot truck stop, I mm -hmm. had this really nice fairy booth, but that had, it had, it's made of four card racks. So, well, it looks like Lucy, you know, Lucy's, uh, the doctor is in. Yes, yes. Where it's a little table, I can sit and people can come up to it, but the cards are, all the fairy cards are on either this in, inner part or the outer part. Mm. So people can also just oh, be okay. yep. kind of around them. And and I just love doing, you know, it, it evolved from the one card to, like somebody said, oh, just do mind, body, spirit. So it'd be like, oh, you pick one, and it's, you know, where's your mind thinking? Mm -hmm. And what I loved about these conversations is I've, there I love conversations like this that mm -hmm. are below Except right. we're not asking you questions, too. Like okay. we're, we're, <laughs> where we get below the surface. Right. right. And I've already sort of shared my drawings I did with my, you know, my hand yeah. that's not as strong. And so it already brings it to a place where someone feels comfortable just to share. Mm -hmm. And the, the conversation remains in a positive place because because they're fairies and the mm -hmm. whole idea is to uplift. So even if you have a sad conversation or a fairy brings up something that's sad, it, the still there's this movement to a positive place. Well, you, I like that anecdote that you did with the demons. So you, here's the demon and here's the solution. Yeah. And you're always moving to the light, it right. sounds like. Yeah. Yes, right. exactly. Yeah. So we have a few minutes left. Um, and I know, I, I believe you also have a choir. For, do you? Um, well. Something around music and people with disabilities? No. Okay. No. No, okay. I'm sorry. No, That's, but there was Awareness Theater Company. Okay. Was, All right. Yeah. Are there, are there, well, two things. One is, so what's the next chapter of your life going to look like? And what are some words of wisdom that you would share with the audience based on your life to this point, mm -hmm. things that you've picked up. Ah, good. Well, I think I'll I'll continue to figure out the the way. Sort of my day was funny. I with the blue bluebird fairies. I went through the women's small business program mm. twice. The first time it was kind of what you know to figure out my theater company, and then it, I it moved into oh no, I want to find a way to do something with these drawings, and. Yeah, I didn't have a full-time job then, but then I was given this great opportunity to have this full-time job, and I by then needed it. So, so this wonderful work with the students is great. I feel like it takes away a little time for really, you know, what can I do with Bluebird Fairies? Because it, it doesn't. It, I would like. To, I would like to figure out a way that I can do more with it. Right. Though at right. the same time. I also like it just as it is. Right. You know, things do have to morph and change. Exactly. And, yes. Um, and yeah, I, I think I think there'll be some interesting evolutions to mm -hmm. to 
you know, I've also created a really strong and solid program with the bridging program yeah. over the last eight years. And now I'm having my students in the program come back, the graduated students, mm. and start to take more of a leadership role mm. with it. So my, my thing is to, to keep growing that. that so that then I could also maybe be working on some other projects. And I'm very connected with Green Mountain Self Advocates. Yep. And, and all of this, you know, is interconnected together yep. in the self-advocacy movement. Um, but what I love is, is, how, is really getting out a little bit more into the wider world and seeing what's, what's going what on. Are, yeah. So there's that. And then, yeah, continuing to figure out, yeah, how do all the... So if we go back fit. to that um, movie, Hair, there, by the way, did you ever see the Broadway play? I, I haven't seen the Broadway play, but I've, I've read it, and, uh -huh. and I love the piece that NPR did on the 50-year anniversary right, of it, right. because it was so helpful to hear how theater goers were having epiphanies by mm. seeing young people and realizing these are just kids. Mm -hmm. They're not crazy hippies right. like we're calling them. Like there was, again, that just seeing it in the face. This, this is the, these are young people wanting to change the world. That's right. And and that's what I yeah. Do you have a? Do, can you envision yourself someday putting a play together like that for another generation of young people? Oh <clears throat> well, it would be somehow like I guess my my what I would love to share with people is just this. Like I just feel like it's so important for people to know who they are and that we do have a lot of inner wisdom that we can connect to and, sh and share with others and the importance I, I feel like of positive thoughts is so helpful because when, when we have big things like mm -hmm. if we're to imagine like putting on something as big right. as that you know the only place that's going to happen is with the higher vibration yes. and so whatever techniques and kind of daily practices that people have you know, that help them feel, um, say, say those good things that we say to other people, but we don't say to ourselves. Mm. I felt like that was the biggest mm. message in the fairy booth is we don't, we, for some reason, we don't learn this. Or I think, I feel like, you know, being in exercises classes now, I feel like there is a new emphasis on you're here for you. You are not here for anyone else. Good point. You know, you're not here to please me I'm doing the exercise. You do what you need to do and you trust your body. So that that I feel like I love being part of that mm. movement. Mm. And if I was to do a big mm. play, it would, it would be mm. on like a celebration of, you know, I would love to do a you know, musical of the of the fairies and the and the demons, but mm. not just mine, like pull in other people's and, mm. um, and then let people know that they can create their own. Mm. Well, given the, the uh, level of suicide that's happening in our society, the opiate and uh, addiction mm -hmm. overdose situation, and so many negative things going on in our society at this point, what you're suggesting and who you are yeah. It's such a gift to this world. We need more Emily's. Yeah. <laughs> I, that would be fun. <laughs> well, yeah, I'll pick great, a fairy right. for that. Yeah. Okay. Ah, fairy of love there for you go. me. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> Open the door and let it in. <laughs> That's wonderful. Is there any anything we haven't touched on that you would like to say before we close? Um, I don't. Th I would just like to thank you, Gary, for for having this feeling of I need to. Well, the obituaries. I love reading, especially the New York Times obituaries. You learn so much oh, from yeah. them. But then you're like, oh, <laughs> that person's not here. Yeah. And you know, any any obituary is is yeah right. is a celebration, but it's it's belated. So right. th thank you for oh, you're more than welcome for you know having, well, I don't want to say you're having living obituaries, but in a sense, yeah, mm -hmm. because one, one should, you know, I am, I'm 56, so I'm definitely moving in, I'm in the fall of my life, and if you're thinking of it as, yeah. you know, yep. Se yep. seasonally, um, yeah, so I definitely am thinking, 
yeah, what, how do I want to use this time? And, right. and, and yeah, celebrate is the perfect word. That's, that's, well, thank you for being on the show. You're this very great, welcome. Great to meet you, Emily. Likewise. Okay.